Good evening, everyone. It's so good to see all of you. I just I, I'm, I feel so blessed that you're all here. For me, this is so late at night. Um, I'm just like this morning person. I, I don't think I could be a jazz musician or a rock yeah, star. Same way. You know, my, like my brain doesn't even work, you know, after like six o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Anyway, but we're so blessed that you're all here, and we're so glad to, I mean, this is a big day in Timber Hawkeye's life. Um, he's been going since crack of dawn, and today is the day when his book is actually being released. So um, we're so blessed to have you tonight. Thank you, guys. Thank you. My name is Malcolm Young. I'm the dean of the cathedral, and um, I've been looking forward to this so much. I've been um, in Buddhist boot camp, like, all the time. Uh, I, just reading it every night, it's a, nice. it's, there's a way in which it's just like seeping into me. And so there'll be times during the day I'll, I'll say it, you know, quote you in my own little way or, nice. or, or, or cite and refer to you. Thank um, you. Such a blessing to have you here as a spiritual teacher. And Thank you. We're so glad you're here. Um, so I, uh, I, I know it's been a big day. Um, Timber was saying, he's like, Malcolm, I, I've, I've been having the biggest day, and I've got this, these words that are, that are running through my head that are, are helping see me through this. So, so, um, so can you share those with us? Yeah, I, I can. Uh, a little segue into that. Uh, <laughs> so today was the day, the, the launch of the new book, and a lot of things can go wrong, just as they do every day in our lives. And, and the only reason they go wrong is because we have this idea in our heads of how it's supposed to go. And, and my intention, my invitation, what I've learned to embrace is to let go of that, to let go of the shoulds, how people should be, how I should be, how the book should launch, how it should look, you know, how it should feel, and just let it go and just accept and just kind of be really fluid with that idea. And the, the greatest idea that has helped me be, to be fluid with is this idea of God. Because for a long time, anytime someone said the word God, it, it filled me in my mind with an idea that's, in my world, and it's, an, it's an, an outdated idea. Yeah, like a bearded guy sitting on a throne in clouds. Yeah, and judging everyone, <laughs> and you know. Keep, keeping a list and exactly. checking it twice. It's, it's almost, yeah. And, and Santa does that, and yeah, apparently the right, Easter Bunny exactly. does that, you and get our a, parents do that. You get a, 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 a stocking full of coal. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And so this whole idea of God, and, and so a lot of us have stepped away from using the word God, and, you know, I, I'd never, I never, I, I let go of it, so I didn't mind it, because it's just universe, Mother Nature, Father Time, and at the monastery, I remember asking one of the elder monks, I said, you know, I, I love the chanting and the sitting and the meditation and the silence. I love it all, but I miss talking about God. There's just no mention of God. And he looked at me and he laughed. He said, what do you think emptiness is? Because there's a lot of talk in Buddhism about yeah. emptiness, and it's just another word for the big question mark. So I wanted to just segue that because this refers to God, in a sense, or it's from, the, from God, so to speak. And a good friend of mine sent it to me because she found out that I had some fires to put out today. The new book wasn't being uploaded on people's iPhones oh, yeah. correctly. Yeah. You know, first world problems here, you know? <laughs> and, and so I'm making phone calls. I'm calling the distributor. I'm calling Apple. I'm, it's... it's it's been interesting. Oh, I'm so sorry, brother. I oh, I know. Just, I mean, it's just it's such a hard but life. But still, though, it casts a shadow on the day, and you know, it'd be just great to not have to think about. It those was things. just one. I was like, I just want to celebrate today. Yeah, man. completely. Open the champagne. <laughs> <laughs> the metaphorical. Metaphorical. Champagne. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hence the air quotes. Um, and so she sent this to me. Consider it a letter from God. Give up the illusion that you deserve a problem-free life. Part of you is still hungering for the resolution of all difficulties, and this is a false hope. Instead of seeking perfection in this fallen world, pour your energy into seeking me. It is possible to enjoy me in the midst of adverse circumstances. In fact, my light shines most brightly through believers who trust me in the dark. That kind of trust is supernatural. It's a production of my indwelling spirit. When things seem all wrong, trust me anyway. I am much less interested in right circumstances than in right responses to whatever comes your way. Yeah. 
And that is the practice. Yeah. It's not about what's happening outside of us, but how we respond to the world outside of us. I mean, that's what Buddhist boot camp is all about, and that's definitely what Faithfully Religionless is all about. It's not having external circumstances disturb our inner peace. And I think it started, as, as I talk about in the memoir, growing up in Israel and being surrounded by terrorism, but choosing not to be terrorized. And yet, how can we apply that in our daily lives here, surrounded by people at work who are annoying, but not getting annoyed? Yeah. Well, that's one of the things I love so much about Buddhist boot camp is, is, is that um, underlying message where, where even the most difficult circumstances in our life, I mean, even the people who, who just grate on us in, in, in such deep and profound ways, that, that, that they, they can, you know, if you can allow yourself to see it in the right light, they can be teachers that are maybe more effective teachers than even the people who tell you you're great all the time. Absolutely. I, I have this particular person in mind. I mean, I was just like, had his face in my mind as mm. I read him. And I, and I just it came, I came to love the guy in a totally impossible way because he'd made my life miserable yep. and his, his picture would just flash up in my mind mm. as, I, as I read it. Yeah, and for me, definitely in the new book is my mother. That's been... Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. I, didn't, I just didn't want to you know, put you on the spot, but that's exactly who she is, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, and, and, and I, I've come to treasure those teachers because... Without them, I wouldn't be challenged. I wouldn't learn of a, a new way to be. You know, it's, it's, it's fun and fine to just be silent and calm in the monastery. But how can I apply that in day-to-day -day life in downtown Los Angeles or in traffic, as Darren said earlier, trying to find a parking spot, you know, on Tuesday night ne next to Grace? So I think a lot of it has to do you know, the seeking. We're all looking for a simple and uncomplicated life. And that stems from this illusion of the pursuit of happiness. And we're so busy pursuing it, we're so busy searching for it, we've made our lives really, really complicated. Yeah, yeah. And in our attempt to make it uncomplicated, it's very weird. And I think that the moment we stop searching, is that it's, you know, if you've ever been single and your friends are all, you know, because you're out there and you got your online profile and you're blind dating and speed dating and, and people, all your friends tell you, oh, the moment you stop looking is when you find oh, someone. Oh, gosh. I, I hear, oh, that's God. a terrible thing to say. To it, it is. <laughs> um, it's like it, my mother used to say, I'd say, I lost something. She said, where, where, where's the last place you saw it? <laughs> yeah, if I knew that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so in, in my continuous search, I found the greatest bliss came from just letting go, just, just allowing and stop trying to label myself. Am I Buddhist? Am I Jewish? Am I, what, what am I? You know, and it's like, you know, my altar has Jesus on it. It has St. Francis. It has the Buddha. It has a picture of Tyler Durden. You know, and they get along just fine. Um, and Gotta get a picture of Darren up there, man. <laughs> then you'll be really, it'll, that'll help you. If I get a, <laughs> picture of Darren's kid on there. Oh, yeah. I mean, even more. Because that's my teacher. I, I teacher. have this, I don't know how to relate to children, and so I, I just freak out, yeah, you know? Yeah. Well, he, and, he'll, he'll set you straight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as soon as I walked upstairs, he's like, grab my hand. Let me yeah, show you around. Cool. Yeah. Who are you? What? <laughs> and tried to force feed me this, what, month-old uh, How? what was it? A gingerbread house that was like oh, great, stale great. and <laughs> old and was like, try. Mm. Yeah. One of your um, one of the uh, favorite th th um, principles that keeps coming up. Your first principle in Buddhist boot camp is that the opposite of what you believe is true. It's it's also true for somebody else somewhere else because of their time, place, and circumstance. Yeah. That's been just, and I think that lesson didn't come from school. It didn't come from it just from traveling, from going all over the world and seeing how other people live. And when I travel, I don't stay in hotels. I, I, I sleep on people's couches, literally. And people define comfortable very differently. Uh, people define quiet very differently. Uh, and, and those are just the simple ones, you know? And when you step far outside of what's moral and what's ethical, what's, you know, what's your definition of God? What's my definition? What's your definition of love? They're so different. And, and I had to just, Rumi said, beyond right and wrong, there is a field. Yeah, I yeah. will meet you there. Right. And I'm like, meet me there. I want to set up camp in that place <laughs> and just invite all of you over to where we can sit in a big circle and we can all share 
our version of the truth. Yeah. And, and we, you know, Rumi, I mean, the guy lived at the crossroads of the world. I mean, yeah. so he knew Christians, he knew Jews, he knew Muslims. Yeah. You know, he himself was a Sufi. And so he was drawing on all the Sufi. He was sitting at that place that you mm-hmm. described yeah. where you could have these conversations with people from around the world and, and, and they could enlighten you and share with you. And I think that's part of the reason why his teaching has so much power for us today. Absolutely. And it's not forced on you. It's yeah. just if this is helpful for you, great. Yeah, exactly. Use it if it's not. Don't, don't cling to it, you know? Yeah. And, and even if something is helpful for you today, it may not be tomorrow. Yeah, so yeah. clinging to anything is just a bad idea. Just, <laughs> I, so I've treated everything in my personal life as an experiment. And I love that. So when you think about what you're trying to do, should I live in San Francisco? Should I move to Seattle? Should I get this job? Should I date this person? It's like if you just approach it as an experiment, I'll just try this for a while, see how it works. And, as, and, and keep reevaluating. And as long as it works, keep doing it. You know, being vegan. I'll, I'll try that for a while, and I'll get my blood tested just to make sure yeah. four times a year that I'm getting enough protein and iron and calcium. Yeah. Because you can do it, you know, where you're malnourished, best intentions, but that's not going to help you. Yeah. So well, I love what I love about the first principle is 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 its openness to being surprised. That's what I just think oh, is so great. Oh, yeah. About it. I wonder behind it is you know do you see it like a kind of basic part of human being like is, is compassion like mm. something that lies in at the heart of all of us or is is there something that's universal you know um, behind all those expressions that are all so idiosyncratic and different absolutely i think that's kind of our innate nature is to just allow to witness what someone else is doing and just go well, that's interesting you know the way children are in a playground you know, they, they, before they learn how to judge <laughs> and discriminate, they're just curious. They approach everything with curiosity. And my dad said, you know, your old journey, it's not about learning anything new. You're just trying to be two years old again, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah, because yeah. back then, you, you just, what's going to happen if I put glue on my hand? What's going to, you know? Yeah, right. That Elmer's glue and you peel it off. Yeah. Or <laughs> as I found out, what, can I staple my nail? You can't, by the way. You can't. Um, it's just very painful. It is. <laughs> my mom, I cried and my mother came in the room and I just grabbed a sock and I put it on my hand. <laughs> What's wrong? Nothing. Oh. And she, she, she pulled it off and of course I had to, get, anyway. So this idea of curiosity and just allowing, and I think when we're curious with our own beliefs and thoughts, then we're really open to, tell me what you believe. Yeah. Not, with, not to prove you wrong but to just be like, huh, that's You know, really the curiosity part is just definitely between the lines and everything. Like, I, I think you could write a whole new book on curiosity. Maybe that's the third book. Mm. But um, <laughs> when you were living in Hawaii, I, I, I want to hear more about what that experience was like. And one of the questions, first questions I, I, I told my kids we were going to be meeting, my, my wife's native Hawaiian, mm. the kids. Are, oh, nice. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're you know, dialed in. My nice. daughter plays ukulele, they dance hula, Love it. you know, um, surf. Um, but I was wondering, you know, if you could talk a little bit about your experience there. I mean, do you have like a favorite Hawaiian word? Um, <laughs> did, yeah, what was that experience like for you? Uh, for me, Hawaii made sense. I wanted to lead a simple and uncomplicated life. Yeah. And everything I like to do is outdoors. You were saying earlier that you don't exercise indoors. So yeah. if, where can you go where it's always nice out? You know, and, and volleyball is free, tennis is free, hiking is free, going to the beach is free. All these things. I'm like, why do people think living in Hawaii is so expensive? And like, oh, well, milk is really expensive. Safeway. Well, it's, it's the most expensive Safeway in the country. Of is course, online. yeah. But, you know, there's a Costco down the street. <laughs> right. It's um, true. Now. And milk may be expensive, but I don't drink milk. So I'm like, all right, I scratch that off my list. <laughs> Meat's really expensive. Well, I'll scratch that off my list. And the so, mangoes are free. Mangoes are free. <laughs> so um, there's this... What drew me to Hawaii, in, in addition to this beautiful lifestyle, was I didn't, when I went visiting, and I talk a lot about it in the second book, is um, because people, like, you read the first one, they go, I want to know more about that. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I dove deeper into, is all the personal stories behind it, and the culture, and the, the non-judgmental nature of it, because I just wore board shorts every day, and that was very different from Seattle, where... It was, you know, yeah. we, we judged each other on the stitching in the back of your jeans. Remember, remember, I didn't, like, are those sevens? Are those true religions? What are you wearing? <laughs> you know, and it's, it's funny. That is not what it's like in Hawaii. <laughs> no, no, not at all. You just like, everyone, on the, it's funny because everyone gets their board shorts at Costco. So everyone kind of has the same board They're shorts They're same on. patterns, totally. <laughs> I got the same, you guys probably match. <laughs> so, um, 
the, the Hawaiian culture, for sure, even the word aloha or kina ole, which yeah. I discussed in the book about right. doing the right thing at the right time, the right way. It just, be, oh, and, and aloha, which just so close to shalom in, in Hebrew, yeah, which is. is hello, goodbye, and love, and peace. And so I say shalom quite a bit. It's basically, it's, you know, it's, it's all about the breath. You know? Yeah. You know? Yaha, the, the Hawaiian greeting where you just grab each other by the yeah, head, exactly. put foreheads that's together, that's and totally you just it. inhale together. Right. And I'm that's, just like, that's that is it. so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that beautiful moment of just forehead to forehead, inhaling together, to me, that was intimate. And so, you know, in Hawaii is also when I decided to experiment with celibacy. 10 years later, still works. Um, but what it forced me to do, and I talk a lot about it too in the book, is, is to redefine intimacy in non-physical terms. You know, because we can't rely on that to be intimate with one another. And I learned at the monastery and in Hawaii how intimacy is just this allowing, just this providing space for someone and being vulnerable with them. Vulnerability is so beautiful. Yeah, I think vulnerability yeah. is sexy. You know, yeah. and and it really helps two people connect. So Hawaii was life changing for me. And you have a yeah. section in the in the book about sexual ethics. And mm. um, I came from a church that was so elderly. Like we just didn't. I mean, sexual ethics was just not what we talked a lot about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, I, I remember preaching one sermon about sex. And I was like, you know what? No one out there cares about this at all. <laughs> It's just like, you know, as if I was pre preaching about what happens in Malaysia, you know. Mm. But, you, but you mentioned that, and, and, and it seems like it's an important part of just, you know, what your teachings are. But, so what's your message when it comes to that? It's, it's about sexual responsibility, just having your own. I mean, I was, uh, I sat in in one of uh, Darren's classes. He was teaching, it was teacher training. So instruct, uh, those who are going through the training to be yoga instructors. And there was this talk about what is proper behavior between the yoga instructor oh, yeah, and the right. student. Right, of course, because you're touching. There's them, touching. What's asking appropriate? And, yeah. and some well, can you that. hit on your student after class? Right, what if a student right. hits on you? You know, yeah. there is this weird, blurry line. You're of totally right. What's appropriate? We fall in love and with our teachers. Yeah, and and you know, you wear a collar, so you're like, all right, this is where I draw the line. Totally. <laughs> is, make sure no one falls in love with me. I, yeah. My wife would hate it. Yeah. <laughs> and. And initially, when I, when I first took the monastic vows, I was in full robes as well for yeah. two years. Uniforms and, help. And Yeah, so the robes help. Yeah. They communicated, hey, I'm available for certain kinds of relationship, but not for others. Yeah. And that really helped. And in the monastery, it made sense because we all wore the same clothes. We all had the same haircut. We're all the same. It really it made it tangible, all the stuff we're talking about, but we're all one. It was like, yeah, look, we're all literally. <laughs> we, yeah. You don't know who it is walking on the path in front of you. But when I left the monastery and I was still wearing robes, they conveyed a very different message. Oh, yeah, right. People started treating me differently. And, you know, and at the airport and I'm wearing robes, people yeah. are like, oh, you know, yeah, from sorry, let me move. Yeah, yeah, and, exactly. I, and I knew the robes had I to go when mean. an old lady on the bus offered me her seat. You know, oh. and I was like, no, I do not want special <laughs> right, treatment. Exactly. And so now it's just jeans and a t-shirt and it's just, my own teacher said, why are you wearing robes? Why can't you just be the guy in town with the bright eyes? Yeah. So, so with the sexual responsibility, it's, it's really about asking ourselves, you know, like, when I have sex, why am I having it? And that's a really tough question to, yeah. to be honest with yourself right. about. Because for right. me... Am I trying to build up my own insecurity? Or yeah. is it because I have something great to share? I I'm, I'm really love this person yeah. and I want to connect more deeply. And, and can I connect stories. more deeply without sex? Or even sex. just like I, I miss somebody else and, and, and I <laughs> try to fill that hole with a, you know... That's interesting. That yeah. To ask that question to of ask, intention. And, and my answer was not pleasant for me to look at. I was having sex because I felt insecure, because I, I associated someone wanting to sleep with me, with me being beautiful, with me being attractive, with me being loved. And so I slept with anyone. <laughs> I was yeah. just like, yeah, bring it on. Um, and I, but I didn't feel loved. I felt empty. I yeah. felt, and I realized that I can't rely on, on looking for love outside of me. And, and so, again, the question was, why, why am I looking for it outside of me when I know it's not out there? So asking ourselves the question, when I'm having sex, why am I having it? When I'm eating this, why am I eating this? Yeah. When I'm saying this, when I'm wearing this, when I'm doing what I'm doing, working where I'm working, living where... Why? And, it, and it, 
gets you, I think, ultimately, hopefully, to your core values. And once you are really honest with yourself about what your core values are and the kind of person you want to be, you can cross-reference it with the person you are, and you'll immediately see where you have some work to do. Yeah, I love that. I love it. You know, I, I'm almost my, I mean, the thing, one thing that recurs so many times in the book, I mean, that was one little section. Mm -hmm. um, but in a way, that's exactly what you say about anger. Oh, you know, yeah. Um, to treat anger in the exact same way that you describe. Why am I having sex with this person? Yeah. Um, why am I angry? And, yeah. and I, I love what you say about um, anger as being kind of like the, the opposite of gratitude. That yeah. It's almost like impossible to hold those two things in your mind. And Not almost like. Time. It actually yeah, scientifically right. impossible is impossible. to be impossible. one. Or you have to you know, choose one or the other. Yeah. It's, yeah. There's, there's a concept in psychology called cognitive dissonance. Yeah, it's right. It's where your mind can't ho hold two opposing thoughts at the same yeah. time. It's like looking at that picture that it's got like the old face or the sexy woman. And oh, yeah, You yeah. can't see them both at the same time. You, you can see the sexy woman. For a minute. And then you can see the old lady. You can't flip back. You can't see them at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And you, and you can be angry with your spouse, and you can be grateful for your spouse, but you can't be both at the same time. The moment you're angry with them is the moment you've forgotten how grateful you are to have them in your life. And the moment you remind yourself, you know, I'm, why am I so angry? Like, I am so great. I'm so blessed. I'm so, this is so, and all that anger goes away. And the moment you, the anger comes back, that's because you've forgotten how grateful you are. They just, and that's why gratitude is such an important practice, to just keep reminding yourself yeah. what you're so grateful for. The trick with cognitive dissonance, you know, the, the, the holding two opposing thoughts, a really good example I often use is uh, smokers. Smokers know that smoking is bad for them, and yet they smoke. So how is that possible? Because those are two opposing thoughts. I know smoking is bad for yeah. me. I'm going to smoke two packs a day. <laughs> There's, and so the way we fix that, we introduce a third thought in between to make them make sense. Smoking is bad for me, but it's not crack cocaine, so I'm going to smoke two packs a day. <laughs> or it's, yeah, or I'll, I'll change, um, you know, when I get to be older, I'll just be a smoker. Exactly. I'm, I'm only person. doing this temporarily. Yeah, or I'm yeah. only, there's some, as soon as I get married, I'll stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the idea, is to just kind of reevaluate, to look at ourselves. We, we judge other people so much. But the invitation is to look, it's, it's just like with yoga, with Darren, what Darren does so beautifully upstairs. You know, don't look at what your neighbor is doing, you know, how they're getting into that pose. I don't. love that, though. I mean, I, I just look at the pe people <laughs> around me, and, and they're so incredible at what they do. And, 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 and they inspire me to think that maybe one day I'll, I'll, I'll kind of approach them. But you're right, don't make comparisons. No, they're, you know, you, they're, they may have been practicing 30 more years than you. Right. Or they may just be way more limber. They, they yeah, may not yeah. have the injury you have. They, there are so many factors. And to compare yourself to them, and really, honestly, the pose, the stretch, the muscle that you is the same yeah. whether you're touching your toes or you're only halfway there. You're still stretching the same muscle. Yeah. Well, the other things, I mean, we're, our bodies are so different. I mean, yeah. I just, there's another man there tonight, and he, he is, was so fit and strong. I just admired him so much. But his arms must be like two inches shorter than mine, <laughs> <laughs> which made him more attractive looking and all. But, um, but, but it, it did. It made, I mean, man, I, I can touch my toes really easily. And, yeah. But, but yeah. And he's like, <laughs> Exactly. It's like that, that dinosaur cartoon you've all seen. <laughs> who is like, damn, push-ups. <laughs> <Right>, um. Completely. <laughs> yeah. so. Hey, you know, um, one of the things in, in, uh, that, I, that I, I've been thinking about so much is, it, it, like, like I said, gratitude is such a central part of your program. Yeah. You know, um, you mentioned Eknath Iswan. Yes. It, it, you know, so I grew up with him, and yeah. he, he was my teacher, and he was a huge blessing in Did my life. Did you get to meet him in Berkeley? Oh, when we he spent was... all time oh, in Berkeley and Petaluma and, and um, all, you know, uh, uh, Ramagiri everywhere. Um, so he's a huge, huge, larger-than-life figure in, for, in my Mine life. As well. And um, one, of his, one of his teachings was about single-pointedness of attention. Yes. So, I mean, basically what he said is when you do anything, do that one thing. Yeah. Don't do a bunch of things at once. So when you're driving, don't listen to the radio. That's his toughest one. <laughs> and, um, and, and I wonder... Um, but my audio book is okay. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I know, seriously. I'm kidding. I'm i kidding. got to fess up. I have listened to an audio book <laughs> as I drove. drove. But, um, but I think, you know, after reading your book, I was thinking, I think that might um, have something to do with gratitude for him. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Because he, it does. He talks about eating a tangerine and yeah. having a conversation at the same time. Yeah. And you just like doing... Before, yeah. you're like, oh, wait, where did it go? it go? You're not even conscious that you're eating it. You didn't enjoy the tangerine. Tangerine, yeah. or you didn't enjoy the conversation because yeah. you were focusing on the tangerine. But one way or another, you skimped out on something. Yeah, he's yeah. a re really big part of the new book. I mentioned him over oh, right and on. over. I'm so glad. Is is so 
I mean, he was there from the moment, I mean, he was 93. It was only three years after I moved to San Francisco from oh, Israel. Funny. Barely spoke English. And a good friend of mine gave me this book, Meditation, about yeah, um, right. uh, passive the meditation. Point, yeah, for and, and I've been sitting with that. That's why I have St. Francis on my altar, because I've been yes, sitting with the course, prayers. Of so course. yes, I'm technically Jewish. My morning uh, meditation is the Catholic prayer of St. Francis. Yeah. Um, I have Jesus on my altar, an ordained Buddhist, and, and it's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ishwaran was, uh, I mean, he, he loved the world religions. Yeah. Um, and, and just saw in those spiritual practices um, just parts that we can learn from one another. And, yeah, um, and doing one thing at a time is so key. Yeah. And, and yet... We live in a world where multi multitasking is yeah. celebrated. I mean, that's it's this idea perpetuated by the, the corporate world that you're an asset to the company if you can do multiple things at once. And I I just I think that we lose mindfulness if we you know, again I talk about this a lot of the brushing your teeth and picking your outfit. Then you're not mindfully brushing your teeth. I mean, have you ever caught yourself like, man, I've been spending a lot of time on that side of the mouth because I've been thinking about something else. Yeah. And it's just, just do that one thing at a time. Yeah. And if you're trying to do that because you're trying to do too much, maybe you're trying to do too much. I compared, I don't know, you, you would remember this. Uh, some of you may, the magicians who used to spin plates. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Keeping all those plates in the air. And yeah, how so you, you spin it? one, yeah. on, there's a pole on stage, and they spin it, and then they go, and they spin another one, and, they spin, and the idea is to not let any of them drop. And the drama is that one starts wobbling, and you spin that one, and another, so you think, oh, when's he going to drop it? Yeah, and, and or oh, he's going to add another one, and, and another one, an and, and that's what we do. I look yeah. at so many of my friends, and they're just like, man, I'm so stressed out, I'm so this, and, and, and I just took on this extra project, I'm like, Hold up. <laughs> you were already stretched too thin and you thought it would be a good idea to add one more thing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, so I, I, I think one of the questions I had too is just, you know, other than single pointedness of tension, do you have other in mindfulness? Are there other practices for gratitude to help us to be more uh, grateful? And yeah, uh, the, the daily list. I mean, even if oh, you're yeah, techie, right. just yeah. there's a gratitude app. You know, um, just if you just, I, I do this every morning, not on an app, but um, in your mind, in my, I just like before, the app in your head. I'm just like so <laughs> grateful, you know, for this warm blanket right now. And I'm so grateful for the roof over my head. And I'm so grateful for functioning lungs and a beating heart and, and, and everything. Because if the alternative and what so many of us do is like, oh, I didn't get enough sleep and oh, my back hurts and oh, it's cold outside. So we start our day with so much negativity and we're kind of setting the tone for the day. But if you start your day with focusing on what does work, what doesn't hurt, what is, <laughs> what yeah. is wonderful, you're going to bring that perspective to the rest of your day. You're going to look at everything and everyone with that level of gratitude and yeah. appreciation and it, the, even though you've been here since 7 o'clock in the morning and we're oh, yeah. both exhausted, it's way past our bedtime, that doesn't matter. I'm so glad I'm here. I'm so glad to meet so many of you, and I'd love to sit and have a conversation with well, all I, of you. I, I, we feel so grateful. I mean, this is a special day in your life. I mean, what a blessing that we could all be with you for this just, adventure that you're with on. With each other, yeah. yeah I'm sorry about the app not loading or the page is not working. <laughs> Woe is me. <laughs> So, um, so you are like you're a local kid. I mean, you grew up right here in the city. Yeah. And um, I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about. I mean, you've been around the world. You've you've, you've been on book tour forever. Yeah. You're kind of like an itinerant teacher. You know it's, what is what is um, what is unique about our region spiritually? What is special about this place? Um, and 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 what's our contribution to the kind of global world of spirituality? Oh, huge. Uh, so yes, I grew up here right on 44th and Pacheco. I didn't want to tell him the address, but I was oh, thinking no. yeah. I, I went back to the house the other day. I knocked on the door and said, hey, I grew up here. Can I see my old room? And he's like, sure. And so I grabbed my laptop, and I'm facing, FaceTiming with my dad, walking oh, him that's through cool. our old that's house. That's really cool. That's great. And, I'm uh, glad you included him on it, too. Yeah, I did. I was like, that's look, awesome. they still have the same linoleum from, you know, <laughs> where you and I used to fold the newspapers when I was a newspaper you know, yeah, delivery right. boy. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, I moved here high school, didn't speak a word of English, and, and just... Dove right in. I wanted to be the all-American kid. Yeah. And hence the paper boy job. And you're like the last paper boy in America. I, the maybe. <laughs> I don't, there's no more kids on bikes throwing. No, I haven't seen one wow. in 20 years. Yeah, that's that, that was me. <laughs> yeah. that, that was me. You're the last um, one. And uh, and so 
culturally speaking and, and spiritually, I moved from a tiny little town in the northernmost part of Israel where everyone was Caucasian just like me, Jewish just like me, and none of it mattered. We all looked the same. Right. To San Francisco. I mean, the most culturally diverse city in the most culturally diverse state. And I went to high school. There were 3,000 students in my school. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the my minority of us were white. And, and it was just really interesting. And instead of... The rest of my family really clung to Judaism all of a sudden. Something that never mattered to them before all of a sudden mattered a lot. I can imagine. And I was like, ooh, what do you believe in? What do you believe in? I was really, again, back to curiosity. And there was so much here, and we were all getting along just fine. And I was like, this is so beautiful. And what a lot of you don't know is that the war in Israel, the biggest war in Israel, is not between the Israelis and the Palestinians. It's between the Israelis who are super religious, the, the Hasidic Jews, and the rest of us. And we're constantly at war with one yeah. another. All the graffiti in Israel, it's all from the Hasidic Jews. It's all from the extremists. Wow, that's and it was so interesting because I never encountered in my daily life in Israel the, what you see here on the news of what living in Israel is like. But moving here and, and, and getting really curious about different world religions, San Francisco was so important, I think, for me as where I landed because I was exposed to so much. And now not just grateful to be here in San Francisco, but at Grace Cathedral, where on a Tuesday night, you've got hundreds of people doing yoga at a church. And I love that, because there is no, we tend to think, oh, I watched a video that they did on, on, on Darren and the church and, yeah, and yeah. yoga here on Tuesday nights. And what I didn't like about the video is they said two worlds collide. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, that's, I would not say they collide. Yeah. And I wouldn't say they're even two separate worlds. Right. We're all, I mean, like my sister, she's like, in your world, it's perfectly okay to pick up a hitchhiker. <laughs> but in my world, and I'm like, we live in the same world. Yeah, right. And, and the universe, the one, the th- one it's one it's, thing. And, and that's why I love this whole idea of, of all of us. I don't think it's two worlds colliding. If anything, they're merging. They're this beautiful cross-cultural, cross-racial, cross-age, yeah. cross this message of, of gratitude, kindness, compassion, love, it's not about being Christian, it's about being Christ-like. Yeah, it's not totally. about being Buddhist, it's about being Buddha-like or whoever inspires you like. The best version of Moses-like. you. Moses-like. Like. Moses, whoever. <laughs> Your Aunt Betty-like, you know? Um, and, and I think San Francisco is such a melting pot, as is Hawaii. I mean, yeah. Hawaii does not have a single majority group. It's all minorities. It's pretty fantastic. Yeah, yeah. The, in yeah. many ways, I mean, a lot of things that happen in Hawaii happen earlier than they happen on the mainland because of that, the, the, the d- demographics and yeah. the islands. All the plantation workers came in, and, um, and, and you're right, there's, no, not, there's not, not a minority, there's not a majority, yeah. or, and, it's, and it's, it's a beautiful thing to see, and... In San Francisco. Well, that's a good, I, I like that. I mean, sometimes I think we can just take for granted the place that we live in. It's almost oh. like the air that you breathe, you know, like the fish in the water, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. we just kind of forget about it. Go to LA for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> You'll appreciate the air you breathe. Yeah, I haven't been down there for a while. Yeah. So um, I, 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 I look at you and, and um, I feel like you have such a powerful vocation. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, I mean, how did, how did you discover that you're going to become a, a spiritual teacher? No. I mean, how did I'm, that kind of unfold in your life? I mean, I I would never classify myself as such. Uh, I'm a sharer. I, I never intended for any of this to happen, literally. I moved to Hawaii. I sent my friends a letter every month to let them know what's going on with me. And after eight years, my best friend said, you know those letters you've been sending us? You should put them all online, like a blog or a face, something. And I didn't even have a Facebook. I didn't have anything. And she, I'm like, why you who would want to read this? <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I mean, that was the most stressful part of my days when a coconut fell off the tree a little <laughs> too close to my head. And she said, go ahead and share it. And I did. And the response was unbelievable. Yeah. The personal stories, the vulnerability, the honesty, people really related to that. And and so the blog became a book, and then and I just self-published the book because I didn't know I've been making seven to ten thousand dollars a year for the last decade, and I'm the happiest person I've ever met, yeah. <laughs> and and certainly happier than I was when I was living here in San Francisco, working at a law firm, yeah, right, making a lot race. of money during yeah, the dot com boom. Yeah. Oh yeah, receptionists yeah. were making sixty thousand dollars a year for answering the phone. That was yeah. the day seventeen years ago. Yeah, right. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, you're right. I mean, was, it was yeah. 
It was, it was insane. It, it was, was fantastic, insane. though. And, and, and the, the, the other part of that is that your rent went up every six months because they give you this move-in special, and you're like, ooh, sounds good. And then six months later, they spike it up, and you're like, hey, got to move. But that helped me not hang on to anything because I knew six months later I'm going to have to pack it all up and move it again. I think that started the whole minimalist movement for me <laughs> is to yeah. just get rid of stuff. And there's a direct relationship between the stuff that we get rid of that's tangible and the stuff that's in our heads, the judgments, the opinions, the, the, all that, that negative self-talk. We can get rid of that too because it's the same muscle. So yeah. exercising one helps the other. Uh, I'm trying to bring it back. So uh, Hawaii becoming... Oh, so, so the book was published and I was invited to give a talk somewhere. And so I went and, and before I knew it, it was a room full of people. And I said, okay, first of all, I said, okay, everybody get up. <laughs> Let's sit in a circle because I don't feel comfortable standing or sitting in front of you. Um, it's, it separates me yeah, yeah. in a way. And, and granted, there's no podium or anything like that, but there's just, I like it to be more of a discussion. And then so we, we all got up and we had this beautiful talk. And before I knew it, two and a half year long book tour across the US, UK, and Australia, just going and talking to people about Buddhist boot camp. And what I found is that we all share this search and, and, and for, for happiness, for a higher being, if you would, for, because a lot of people had a terrible experience with the church or with religion or the Bible or their school if they went to Catholic school. And so it, and it turned out to feel a lot, our meetings turned out to feel a lot like um, AA meetings, yeah, yeah. where it's like, hi, my name is Bob and I'm a recovering Catholic, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it was like, hi, Bob. And, but what the problem with that is that people, because they had a bad experience with one aspect, they threw it all away. Yeah. They threw away the church, the Bible, God, religion, all of it. And I'm like, well, well God wasn't the problem. Bring, bring it back, bring it back. God wasn't, you know. And, but there's this resistance to calling it God or whatnot. And so we consider ourselves spiritual but not religious. And, and so all the talks that I gave... I was like, you know, none of this stuff is written down. <laughs> and so eight months ago, I moved into a little cabin in the East Sierras after all that touring. And what was nice about the cabin is it was like 10 degrees outside. Oh, yeah. You stay I don't do there. cold. Yeah. You can't go from Hawaii to 10 degrees. You just, you, at 70, I'm like, ooh, it's, it's cold. <laughs> um, so it forced me to stay inside and just pour all of this out. In, in, in a really safe container because I wasn't, I mean, there were no neighbors. I just had coyotes and bears and snakes. Um, and, and hope not spiders because I read about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if any of you have read the book, the whole aversion to insects. Um, but, you know, there were some spiders. Yeah, but and you, well, you, like you told us, you, you mastered that. You I got just, that yeah, down I just got, I got, I'm like, hey, Bob, I got, your, your name is Bob. And <laughs> you don't want to be in here any more than I want you in here. So let's, let's go outside. And um, I had... Uh, I found, what was it, um, scorpion? Yeah. And I was like, hey, what do you do? You don't want to be in here, you know? And so I just took him outside, and it was just really interesting not separating. You know, this whole idea of separateness is just an illusion. And so just kind of going, okay, you, you have a family somewhere, or you're hungry, and <laughs> I'm sure not for my food. Um, so, yeah, just this whole idea. And, and so spending all that time in the cabin was really good because... The book is so vulnerable. It's so raw. It's so open. Well, I mean, that's one of the things. I, I, I mean, even Buddhist boot camp, which you're right. Yeah. I mean, there's a way in which it's, it's, it's yeah, the focus isn't quite as much on your autobiographical story. No. But I mean, there are some. I mean, that ch section on repentance, where oh. you list the things that you've done that you're uh, that you're probably sorry for, um, and uh, I mean, it was just terrifically revealing. Your talk about your experience with your mother, struggles mm -hmm. with anger, description of what it was like working in the law firm. Yeah. You know how. You know, you kind of put that hard shell and just really direct kind of. Yeah. And I, I, I just wonder about that personal revealing part. Like for repentance, how, how important is for uh -huh. other people to have that revealing section? And, and how do you decide who to reveal to, who not to reveal That's to? That's a tricky how one. How important yeah. is it in, in repentance? I think repentance itself is important. Now, whether you do it publicly like me yeah. or you're just honest with yourself first. That's because you can imagine writing that stuff down writing all the stuff that I've done and just saying, this is something I've done in the past that I won't do again. I'm not, I'm not a terrible person just because yeah. I've done some terrible things. And it's this beautiful acceptance that I am not who I was and I'm not the things that I've done. I am who I choose to become today. Yeah. 
And so the message, the repentance chapter, and the rest of the book really resonated a lot with the correctional facilities across the US, Canada, and Australia. Yeah. So I did a couple of like crowdsourcing campaigns and I raised enough money to publish the book in paperback and distribute it to inmates. And before I know it, and thank you, yeah. we have yeah. here a special friend with me tonight um, whose son and I connected through the book while he was incarcerated. incarcerated. And, and then I was, before I knew it, invited to go and talk at prisons. And so I'm sitting around, talk about gratitude. Yeah. And the most beautiful moment is, it was at Corona Maximum Security Women's Prison. And this woman I was talking to, she's like, you know, I'm so grateful for being here. And I'm like, come again? <laughs> and she said, I'm, I, I would not be learning this on the outside. I would not have exposure to this sangha inside the, yeah. the prison on the outside. I would not, I need this time out <laughs> to learn. And I'm so grateful for it because now I can go back out and my family, my friends are going to meet a completely new person. And, and I, I birthed this new person. Yeah. You know, she, she birthed her, a new version of herself and she can't wait to literally come back out into the world. And the beauty in that is that she can embrace and accept the new version of herself, but can we embrace this new yeah. version of her without judgment? And that's the hard part, because we tend to judge others so much. I talk in, in the new book about you know, getting my girlfriend pregnant in, in, in high school, and, and how, what a difficult time that was for us and the only reason she got pregnant is because she's well because we had sex but um <laughs> that'll we'll do we, it yeah that every <laughs> not every time but not every um, time that's the whole problem right yeah um is she was epileptic and she was taking tegretol for epilepsy and we didn't know the tegretol canceled out the birth control pills right. and condoms don't always work and you know before you know it we're the point zero 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 one percent chance that she would get pregnant and she did and she couldn't stay pregnant because of the epilepsy and the medication she was. It was just such a difficult decision. She was very pro-life before this happened. Yeah. And so even making decisions about this kind of stuff ahead of time is dangerous because you don't know what your, what your response is going to be when it happens, let alone judge other people. You don't know their story. And when we went to that clinic in Daly City, there were people outside calling her a murderer. Mm. As if that day wasn't hard enough already. Yeah, yeah. You know, that it, it's just, you don't know our, it's just, right, you don't know, right. everyone is battling something internally that we know nothing about. And I'm, yeah. I'm really grateful. I, I just think that, I, 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 um, I think people who are incarcerated in this country, there's a way which we just forget it. We close the door, forget, mm -hmm. it's like throwing people away. We do that with people in incarcerated. We do yeah. that with the elderly. We, we do, do that with, the, uh, we homeless just. Homeless people. Uh, yeah, homeless yeah, people. Dehumanizing. Just, yeah, and I'm like, I've been homeless, tech and technically right now well, I am yes, homeless. Well, yes, right, you are, um, exactly. And um, <laughs> Just, I won't Thank goodness Taryn takes in homeless people. <laughs> Couchsurfing.org has been my life. A couch surf, I sleep on yeah. everywhere I go. People open their homes, and, and it's really interesting. So, again, my sister, she's like, people let you stay in their house? And I'm like, yeah, why not? You have a couch that sleeps alone every night right. in the dark. Completely that could be someone's bed. <laughs> and... Um, and it's this beautiful, and I open my, when I do have a steady place, steady, um, it's open. I have people come stay with me from all over the world, and we always have a really good time. So, I have a friend of mine who's in, he's serving a 25-year sentence, and I, I, I visit him, mm. um, um, and, and he's, um, sometimes I say to him, I say, you know, you're, you could be like the last person I know who can concentrate because there's no computers, there's no cell yeah. phones, there's no apps. There's, and, and so there, there is a way in which he, he you know, has gotten um, proficient at, at, you know, in the housing trades and yeah. learned how to be an electrician. And, nice. I mean, he just keeps on taking more and more things on. Um, but I do wonder when he comes out, it's a totally different world than yeah. when he went in. And, and I wonder about technology. I mean, mm -hmm. um, part of how you got your message out is, is through, through these new technologies. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about kind of the role of spirituality and these technologies? What well, my, my target audience is not necessarily the people out there who are already going to retreats and if they've already read all the Thich Nhat Hanh books and the Dalai Lama. The, that's not that's necessarily me. who I'm trying. I, I'm it sorry, for but me, though, it worked. Too. I'm not saying it doesn't <laughs> work, but I'm trying to reach the people who would never read a book, which yeah. is really tough. Write a book for people who don't read books. Um, and you know, just really reach out to the, the, the average Joe because I consider myself the average. That's how I stumbled across it. And, and what does the average Joe use as a means of communicating? Well, they're on Facebook where yeah. I will then speak their language. 
you know, and, and that's really important. So go on Instagram, go on Facebook, but how can I do it without losing my head? <laughs> Well, Facebook allows you to pre-schedule all your posts if you, have, if you have a page like mine. So they're actually, I'm sorry to tell you, I'm not actually there typing it all in every morning at 0500. Um, I take a time out and I say for the next you know, hour or so, I'm gonna sit here, I'm gonna schedule the post for the next month or two, and then I'm gonna log off and I'm not gonna touch it. You know? And so every once in a while I do see some of your comments, but often I don't. And it's not that I don't care, it's just there's half a million people um, and we'll just tell you in person. <laughs> yeah, and so, and I travel, you know, and I do, and, and, and that's part of, you know, because I can't just be this person behind the scenes. I, it's, the book is required reading in a few high schools now in California, and it's so important for me to go and sit with the students. And they're like, man, like, we can relate to him. And I'm like, that's the whole point, is that I'm not this facade somewhere that, I only talk about being mindful in traffic, but really I'm, I'm the one who just you know, flipped you off. Um, I'm not, I, I have a little smart car, trust me. I mean, I have no business flipping anyone off. Um, so. so I wonder if you um, can talk a little bit about your meditation practice, just mm. how you came on it and, and, and just what effect it's had on, on, on your everyday life. Absolutely. Um, the, it, and, and first, this idea of meditation looking a certain way, I'm asked often to give meditation advice, and I strictly don't because so many people come to me and they go, I've tried meditating, but I think I'm doing it wrong. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. the only reason you think you're doing it wrong is because someone told you there's a right way to do it. Yeah. And there is no right way to do it. When you go running for eight miles like you did today, and you're just focusing on your breath and, you know, not fall, you know, you just, you're in the zone. You're not thinking about laundry or yeah, yeah. Any, you're just, this is what I'm doing right now. That single pointed, you know, uh, mindfulness, that's your meditation. If you're gardening and you're not worried about, you know, anything else, that's your meditation. If you're painting or if you are sitting in meditation pose. And for me, the beauty of it um, and again, I went really deep. I love that you're asking all the questions that I answered in the new book. And he hasn't read the new book. He's not doing this on purpose. I couldn't. I mean, today is <laughs> the first today's day, day is available. Um, I'm not a speed because reader. Because I've been doing this for two and a half years, like people always ask the same questions. I'm like, you know, what if I just answer this in a book? Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm moving to a cabin in New Zealand. And then it's all good. It's like somebody asks, What's, what? read the book. Um, yeah. No, it's uh, the, the beauty of meditation is not during those 20 minutes that you're meditating. That, I mean, yeah, they're going to be nice. But the beauty is later in the day when you can apply that same level of, okay, so if I'm going to sit here and I'm going to say for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to sit here and I'm not going to move. No matter what happens, I'm not going to move. If my foot falls asleep, so be it. If, if there's an itch in the back of my head, I'm not going to scratch it. Whatever happens, I'm not going to move. The fire alarm goes off, I'm going to maybe inhale a little deeper, see if there's smoke smell, but otherwise, I'm not going to move. And... And you do that, and the benefit of that is not during those 20 minutes. It's later in the day when someone at the office says something offensive, and you're like, wait, I've exercised this muscle. I don't have to respond to that. Yeah. I don't have to attend every argument that I'm invited to. How wonderful it is to not react when people expect you to be enraged. And that's a benefit of meditation earlier in the day, yeah. is you can sit somewhere and... And people ask me, well, what if someone's doing something terribly wrong, you know? And I, I mentioned a story in the book about this woman who watched a guy throw away his soda can in the trash instead of the recycling bin. And she just went off on him. And she's like, what are you doing? Don't you care about the environment? And she just yelled. And I love this guy's response. He's like, lady, <laughs> I just had a bacon double cheeseburger, and I downed it with a Pepsi, and I'm about to have a cigarette. Clearly, I don't care about my own health. What makes you think I give up about the environment, you know? <laughs> and I love that because it's He's so, a teacher. It's so important for us to know our audience. You can't, you can't tell that guy to... You, you get what I'm saying. So the beauty of meditation to sit there and watch him throw his soda can in the trash and the recycling bin and go, hmm, that's interesting. And if you care enough, when he leaves, go up, move it to the recycling bin, and then live, live happily yeah. with your... And, and when someone throws it in the recycling bin, you can go out and say thank you if, you, if you're so inclined. But, but to just 
allow, to zoom out far enough, and I think that's a really, some of the meditation practice is allow, zoom out, because you know those mirrors that some people have in their houses where you flip it over and it's like 10 times magnified? <laughs> Nothing looks good that close up. <laughs> Nothing. But when you zoom out, when you flip it over, you're like, I'm all right. This is okay. Yeah, exactly. And, and the world is very much that way too. If you zoom in on what's going on in the Middle East, you're going to think we're doomed. But if you zoom out a little bit and see, then you, it's actually pretty well balanced. Yeah. It's actually beautifully harmonious. The wars that are going on have always been going on. The beauty in the world is still there. And the moment, it's like that whole cognitive distance. The moment you're focusing too much on this, you're overlooking this. So I'm not suggesting sticking our head in the sand and pretending everything's honky-dory. Quite the opposite. I'm saying look at all of it. Look at the whole beach <laughs> and be like, wow, it's a beautiful world. And yeah. yeah, there's some trash there that someone left behind. But, but there's also an orca whale right there and there's a honu right there. And you know, I would say, oh, and there's some kids playing right there, but that's... That's here, yeah, that may be pleasant for you, and it may be for me. Maybe I'll put my towel on that side. <laughs> so, so I think that's the benefit of meditation is to, to allow, to just, the, what you do in those 20 minutes later in the day, just kind of go, huh, that's interesting. And a little preview, there's a story in there about me falling off a cliff in Hawaii. Uh, you, you might know it if you go surfing out there, China Walls. Oh, yeah, totally. It's, it's one of the most beautiful spots yeah, and a great surfing completely. spot, but it's also one of the most dangerous. You're right. And, uh, you know, just ignore all the signs that say people have died here um, and just go jump off the cliff. And jumping off the cliff is not the problem. It's getting back out. Yeah. That's the problem. And um, I had a little incident where meditation, after all those years, finally paid off because yeah. I was able to be drowning, literally, and going, hmm, I'm drowning. That's interesting. Yeah. Hey, it's happened to me too, man. Yeah. I'll tell you. Yeah. And yeah. just not risk. You just kind of have to let it go. Yeah. You can't fight it. And that's point. letting it go. So speaking of San Francisco, my sister here uh, got really drunk one night. Uh, well, she got drunk a lot of nights, but this one specific <laughs> night. And, um, and she was listening to her iPod really, really loud. And she's drunk. She's crossing the street pedestrian. And she got hit by a car. And she broke both her legs, oh. smashed her face against the wheelchair. Oh, oh. wow. And she survived quite well, actually. And the, the reason she got into the accident is because she was drunk. Yeah. But the reason she survived is because she was drunk. Yeah. Because she was cool. She was yeah. calm. She didn't, she didn't tense up. It's just like when you're surfing, yeah. if you lock your joints, you're going you're gonna to hurt yourself. Yeah. But if you let go, if you just relax, the, the universe is going to do with you what it's going to do with you. And then it'll release you. And if you're not fighting it, you have a much better chance of coming out smiling at the end of it yeah, than uh, that's true. hurt. You know, yoga for me is um, exactly the same. I just, mm. you know, I pra when I practice yoga in the early morning, I mean, for the rest of the day, there's, uh, there's something different about my body. And, and, and there's a way in which I, ha I have a different perspective on things. Nice. And I wonder, um, what's been your experience with yoga and, mm. and, and, and how, how has it helped you in your spiritual <laughs> life? Or? It's definitely helped me last week. I took uh, Darren's class at Yoga Tree right after coming in. To San yeah, Francisco. After being the airplane, it's good. Uh, driving, I'm driving, driving this whole yeah. and a little smart car filled with books. Um, I'm driving. I'm leaving to Seattle day after tomorrow, and then coming down the coast, yeah. and lots of miles on that car. Um, and but I went to one of his classes, and it was a restorative yoga class, which is I pretty much those. a glorified those nap. Great. Okay, yeah. um, those are great. I just, but it's fantastic. It is fantastic. You just lie there and just let your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, it be, brings awareness to a lot of things that you otherwise too busy to worry about. And I love the one, I wouldn't call it an exercise we did because I guess, I guess you could, because you're literally napping. Okay. But one side and then 15 minutes later, the other side. But what was nice is we did this one stretch and then, you know, with, with one leg and then we brought the leg back to the middle and Darren's like, so how does that leg feel differently than the other one? I'm like, well, it feels two feet longer. That's what I was going to say. You know? That's what I like, know the answer to that. It's just so, because we're so caught up like this. And then when you stretch one side but not the other and you, and you kind of lay there, you're like, oh, I feel so lopsided. And, then, and so I think that's the beauty for me with yoga is it brings this awareness of parts of your body that you otherwise are either take for granted yeah. or you're not bringing enough attention to. But again... It's not about what you're doing on the mat. How can you do that throughout the day? Yeah. 
what, are you, what else are you not bringing enough attention to? Yeah, I, 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 I seriously, like when I'm tying my shoes, it's like my yoga pose. That's my asana, my tying nice. my shoes asana. Yeah. Also, all over the day, I, 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 you know, you're just more aware of your body. Yeah, I'm tying my shoes. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm not tying my shoe, talking on the phone, and, yeah. you know, and just, this is what I'm doing right now. And I love just steering away from this concept of multitasking. Yeah. It's just very liberating. It is, it is. I, 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 the quote from Rumi was a, a great way for us mm-hmm. to start our conversation. And, and, you know, I'm so sad to say it, but we're going to kind of wrap it up so that you okay. can meet your fans <laughs> and then so that you can get That's a nice sleep. And, um, but, but my last question is just about um, Rumi and poets mm-hmm. and arts. Um, you know, what artists inspire you? What oh. poets inspire you? You know, who should we um, be keeping our eyes open for? Um, where well, are I'm we not going to shit on you. Sympathetic yeah. souls. Um, I won't shit on you. Well, I'm glad. Like, you should read this. You should read that. Oh, should I? Should I? <laughs> um, if you study nonviolent communication, the word should is, is very it. hostile. I know it is. Um, and, you know, I can tell you, oh, Brene Brown is really great. But oh, you yeah, may read right. it and go, ah. Uh. Yeah, I've seen her TED talk. Yeah, she's she's she talks a lot about shame and, and yeah. acceptance and whatnot. But that resonates with me. And you may watch it and go, "This doesn't sit well with me." And that's why I I just say try everything, try it all, you know. And and you'll find. And and I think if you go to it saying there is something here, and I'm gonna take away from it what what inspires me, and I'm gonna ignore the rest. And I love that is. You don't have to accept it all. And I think I, I tried that for a while. When I moved into the Zen monastery, I was like, this is it. Yeah. I'm not going to do the Tibetan thing. I'm going to be a Zen monk. All right, bring on the black robes. You know, and I wore the black robes. And in, in Zen, they don't call it meditation. They call it sitting because you're literally sitting facing a blank wall yeah. for four to eight hours a day. It's just fantastic because that wall becomes a mirror and it reflects back to you all the stuff you otherwise try to ignore. And so... You know, just saying this is it. But there were certain parts of the Zen monster that didn't sit very well with me. And so I was like, well, this place isn't it. All right, let's look for another one. And it's like there was always something wrong with every place. And so the idea is, is the problem those places or is it me? And if I just, what if I became a little more fluid and a little more flexible and just allowed it to be what it is? Would every place be perfect? Yeah. And can I then find my sanctuary no matter where I am? And can I find inspiration no matter who I read? And I think we can if we don't put them up on a pedestal, if we don't think, oh, this person's going to have all the answers for me. Yeah. No, they're going to have some, but they're not going to have all. And I think that's, for me, why the practice has been so beautiful. Spent some time at church, spent some time at the temple, spent some time talking to members of the KKK. Yes, because if, if, if that's what boils your blood, if you just clenched your fist, that's exactly what you need to do because that's what's going to help you ten, ease up that and go, why? Why did you become a member of the KKK? And when they tell you their story, you can be like, that actually makes sense. <laughs> Considering your time, place, and circumstance, I understand why that appealed to you. And then your, your, your heart opens up to compassion and understanding, not judgment, not ridicule. You don't want them dead. You want to you be their friend. You want to help them. You don't want to join their clan. You don't want to condone what they're doing, but you have understanding for why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. And so, you know, with Rumi, with Beyond Right and Wrong, there's a field I'll meet you there. Um, I like using the example of someone, and especially now there's a lot of political talk going on. Yeah, I tell Can, you, starting to get the seasons... Yep. Can you, can you just listen to someone who believes the opposite of you and just go, well, that's interesting, without trying to prove them wrong, without trying to change their mind, without just, if someone tells me that the, the sky is green and I believe it to be blue, I can just walk away from that experience knowing that to some people the sky looks green. It's that simple. I don't need to prove them wrong. I don't need to show them facts and proof and... Ba- I don't need to boost my own ego and confidence. Like, I'm right and you're wrong. It's like, to you, this guy looks green. Why? It doesn't matter. To me, it looks blue. I could be wrong. I love that I could be wrong. Yeah. I've actually seen green sky, and I'm like, ooh. I know, the tornadoes. There's tornadoes. There's <laughs> the northern lights. Oh, there's yeah, the, true. Yeah. Uh, there's, and, and co- there's colorblind people, you know? So yeah. it's like... There are people who are just bad with colors. Yeah, and, and you know, I just... I, I, I learned recently that I don't see the world the same way other people do. And I don't just mean figuratively. Literally, I have no peripheral vision. 
I didn't know this. I thought everybody looks at the world the same way I do, but I can't see you right now. I know you're there. I am. And I found out other people, <laughs> other people can. That's, I think, why Darren scared me earlier, because he came up behind me to ask me a question. And I think most people assume that everyone else has the same field of awareness, but I'm constantly surprised because I don't see you until you're right there. Um, so... I think just allowing all of us to be different is, yeah. is where, and that's why, whether it be Brene Brown or uh, the Dalai Lama or the new Pope, who's pretty awesome, um, you know, it's, there's, yeah. there's just, there's, there's, I think, inspiration everywhere. Ani DeFranco said you can find inspiration written right on the bathroom wall. And someone commented earlier uh, that they sat down, they read the whole book, the new one, from beginning to end, and th their comment was, I love that you quoted Rumi, and that you quoted Kurt Cobain. <laughs> like, that's just awesome. Because yeah. again, I think we can find inspiration anywhere, everywhere so to answer your question. Yeah. yeah. We're so blessed to have you tonight. And just such a gift that we could be part of the big day for yes. you. And, and I'll be back by Through the Bay again in March uh, right in on. Berkeley Great. and in Pleasanton. Super. Um, and William James, the philosopher William James, believes that everybody's philosophy come to, comes out of their own different disposition. So mm. it's impossible to come up with a philosophy that fits everybody. Yeah. That it, um, e each one of us are, are kind of driven by these dispositions that, that make us see the world in different ways. And then in conversation, we, we talk about what, agree, what we agree on. Yeah. And, um, and that life, life is that conversation. I, I love what you say that um, we should treat everything as an, as a, as an experiment. Yeah. That we should um, yeah. try everything. That's yeah, gonna be, try it all. I'm going to be going to sleep tonight and, and think about how that could be in my life. It's because we tend to think, well, if I we make these decisions that we think are permanent. There's nothing that's permanent. Anything can change. And, and Everything and will. Because we all does. go back to nothingness. Yeah. yeah. We can't take any of the stuff with us. You know, and we're so busy clinging to Like, just let it go. Try it. Try Just try not locking your front door one night. But don't call me if, it get, if, you get, <laughs> you know, if something gets taken away. Send the insurance but, company over. You know, because um, I... I never do, and it's never been a problem. Yeah. And some people like lose sleep overnight because they're worried about this stuff. And I think we manifest those realities if we worry about them. So let it go. Well, we're going to be we're going to be keeping you in our thoughts as you travel on your hey. itinerant way and that little smart car of yours with all the books. And we're so blessed that you're here tonight. I, I know that Thank you're you. selling some books. And yeah, I'll be signing back them there. Tonight. Um, and uh, this um, Sunday, we're going to be meeting Ma Malcolm Margolin. So I don't know if you know him. He's the person who wrote The Ohlone Way. So thinks a lot about Native Americans in mm -hmm. um, California. So it's, um, he's going to be here at 9.30 on Sunday morning. Same room, same time. Or same room at 9.30 a.m. Oh, nice. When I'm awake. <laughs> um, when you're more sharp <laughs> uh, actually just being with you it was wow. great so thank, thank you so you. much for all you did thank you guys all right thank you. such thank a you blessing so <laughs> bless you brother thank you